<clears throat> um, okay, good morning everyone. So we're continuing our series on the Ten Commandments and I'll be speaking today on God's name. So as usual, before we begin, let's commit this time to the Lord. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you. Commit this time to your hands. It is not a time for ourselves, Lord. It is not a time for me to share, but rather Holy Spirit for you to speak through me. We commit this time and give it into your hands, Lord, to use it as you will, to guide us to your truths, and that your words may change our lives for the better, to bring us more and more to be like you, O Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so I'm, I'm sure you're quite familiar with the Ten Commandments, and this will be the Third Commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. So these are part of the Ten Commandments, the most important part of the law that Moses received. So for today, I'm going to take you to three different levels of this, the idea of the name, not to take the name of the Lord God in vain. So we start with level zero. What is God's name? Now, as I shared before, uh, in your English Bibles, you will see Lord in all capitals, and this is from the Hebrew Yahweh. In Malay, you translate it as Tuhan in all capitals. So it's God's personal name, just like my name is Scott, uh, Uncle Stephen's name is Stephen Lowe. People can call him pastor, can call him elder, but his name is Stephen. That's his proper name. So the proper name of our God is Yahweh. And in your Bible, you also see Lord with only the L capital. This is from the Hebrew word Adonai. It means ruler or Lord, or I guess the sort of king. So in Malay, it's Tuhan. You can see how it's related to the word Tuan. And in English, you also see the word God. This is from the Hebrew El or Elohim. It just means deity. Uh, in the Bible, it's also used for the false gods of the nations, like the Egyptian gods, the, the Canaanite gods. And in Malay, it's translated as Allah. You can see the relation there between Elohim and Allah, Him. So that said, now some people, some of us call the name of our God Jehovah, and some Bibles have the word Jehovah. So which is correct? Is it Yahweh or Jehovah? So the theory that is, uh, some scholars have is because in Hebrew, you don't have the original Hebrew doesn't have vowels. So you, see, you just see these four letters and you're not sure how do you pronounce it. So the theory is they took the vowelization from Adonai, which is the Lord, and combined it with Yahweh to get Yahovah. So the second thing is, if it's Yahovah, why do we pronounce it Jehovah? And this is because of the way English evolved. Uh, if you ever watched the show, Liberators of the, uh, sorry, uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, Remember that? At one point, he's stepping on the, the floor panels. He has to walk in the name of the Lord. So what's the name of the Lord? Jehovah. And it's the first letter he steps on is J. But his father just remembers that in Latin, God's name is starts with an I because it's Jehovah. So this is because of the way um, English evolved where I and J ended up being used, uh, they were interchangeable. I is J, the same sound. But then eventually evolved that J becomes a hard J, J sound. And that's why our Yahweh, Jehovah, becomes Jehovah. And uh, you can still see this, the soft J sound, the I sound, in the word Hallelujah. It's spelled with a J, but it's pronounced with the Y of Yahweh's name. This place to Yahweh. And I'm sure you've all been watching Marvel movies. Thor has a hammer. What's the name of his hammer? It's called Mjolnir, but it's spelled with a J. So you can see in our modern in English, we still have this J with an I or Y sound. Now, that being said, this is God's personal name, the name he is to be remembered by forever, Yahweh or Yahovah. So the question is, why don't the Jews Say God's name. After all, this is a name that uh, Yahweh said to remember him by always. And this is, comes back to uh, the Ten Commandments we are speaking about today. I am speaking about today. Um, the Jews are afraid to use God's 
personal name in case they accidentally take his name in vain. So to them, if they avoid using God's name, then they can avoid accidentally using his name in vain. So the, the reason that they don't even say, they don't even spell the word God, you see, they put G dash D. Even the word God, they don't want to put it properly in case they use it in vain because of the third commandment. And we even see this in uh, how the Jewish religion led to Christianity. Uh, this is Exodus 3.15, the same one we just saw, uh, where God's name is Yahweh, to be remembered by forever. This is the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation. And you can see there, the, names, the word is kurios, instead of Yahweh. So they put his proper name, Yahweh, and rendered it as kurios, the Lord because they didn't want to take God's name in vain. Now, in Deuteronomy 6, uh, chapter 6, verse 4, this is the Shema Israel. In the original Hebrew, you can see, uh, Shema Israel, Yahweh Elohim, Yahweh Ehad. So you can see his name there, Yahweh. But in the Septuagint at the bottom, they changed it to Kurios. And this has been maintained into the New Testament. When Jesus cites this verse in, let's say, Mark, the word used there is kurios because they are citing from the Greek Septuagint. So this has come down to us as Christians, which is why our Bibles use the word Lord instead of Yahweh. Lord in all capitals instead of Yahweh, even for the Old Testament. So if this is the way it's done, if this is what Jesus' first followers did, uh, I can't say that we must always use the name of Yahweh only because even for Jesus' apostles, the ones who wrote the New Testament, they use the word kurios, so the Lord. So if they can, it's okay for them, yeah, it will be okay for us as well. Still, personally, whenever I can, I try to use the name Yahweh. It's good to differentiate who our God is compared to all the other gods of all the other religions. So that having been said, we move on to level one, respecting God's name. As it says in the commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord Yahweh, your God, in vain. Now we see an example of this in Leviticus. Uh, there was a woman's son, a man. He blasphemed the name and cursed. Now, which means he said bad things against God's name. So God, uh, God commanded that he be brought here before the whole camp and said that whoever curses his God, whoever blasphemes the name of Yahweh, shall surely be put to death. So in the end, uh, he was stoned to death. So this is the punishment for taking Yahweh's name lightly, using it wrongly, using it disrespectfully or rudely. The person who did this was punished with death. This is how serious it is. Now in our modern society, if you watch any, if you just turn on the television, you have a lot of curse words, uh, four letter words, bad words, um, words with root meanings. So I shared this uh, example before. A lot of Westerners will use God's name, will use God, will use Jesus, will use Christ as a curse word. This is very disrespectful, but this becomes such second nature to them. They don't even think about it. Now imagine when something bad happens and you're upset or shocked. Uh, instead of using like the Westerners do, they say Jesus Christ, using it as an exclamation. What if you use somebody's name? For example, in a youth camp, I've used Uncle Stephen's name before. Something bad happens. Stephen Lau! Oh, it's very disrespectful, isn't it? Imagine you're using his name as a curse word, as an exclamation. Where's the respect for it? Or imagine you use your own parents' name. Imagine you were having a Chinese New Year gathering, and you drop the plate and you book over the floor and you shout out your father's name in his presence. Where's the respect there? You'll be very angry. All your relatives will be shocked because this, this guy, this Sui Chai, has no respect for his parents. So that is how disrespectful it is when people who, who attend church, who claim to be Christians, use Christ's name in vain. Or imagine if you are in a meeting, something bad happens and you curse using your boss's name. You think you'll still be working for long. 
I think very soon you're going to be kicked out of the, of the company. Or if you're walking along and you step in a uh, dog poop and you shout out, let's say your husband's name or your wife's name, I don't think he'll be very happy with you because you're using their name in vain. And yet, and yet in the shows in our public, in the public life, and hopefully only outside our church, when bad things happen to people, when they step in a dog poop, they say, oh my God, or Jesus Christ. And you can imagine how disrespectful it is. We still see this in many countries, for example, in Thailand. If you use the, the name of the king in vain, if you insult him, you will go to jail. This is how serious it is. And similar can be said for Malaysia. So that having been said, this, there's this quote by William Shakespeare. <clears throat> What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Meaning you have a rose. You call it a flower or you call it a, an orchid or you call it a, a bunga melo or you call it a durian or you call it a cat. Whatever you call it, it's still a rose. It still smells the same, no matter what name you put on it. And that relates to taking God's name in vain because we have many ways to call our God. As I said, Yahweh, or some say Jehovah, um, or Lord in all caps in the Bible, or just God, or, oops, sorry, or Jesus, or Christ. So we all know who this means. Now, so I have a story from my youth. I once had a friend who liked to say, oh my God, when something bad happens. And one day I told him, don't take God's name in vain. And he said, I'm not a Christian. Lah. So I said to him, okay, then you can take your God's name in vain. And he laughed at that. But my point being, you, whatever word you use, if you, you know it refers to your God, Yahweh, Jesus, if you know it in your heart, then it's the same as taking his name in vain. So if you use OMG, when you exclaim, oh my God, or you type those letters, it's quite close already. Because you know who you're talking about. It's not very respectful. So for this first point, respecting God's name, I'll encourage all of us to, um, go a, to walk away from, to train ourselves not to use these things which the world uses. Even OMG, it's very easy to go, right? So gradually, wean yourselves off uh, all this casual use of God's name. God's name is holy, and God's name is precious. Treat it that way. At least with the respect, you treat your own name, uh, your parents' name, your boss's name. I move on to the second level, which is what I call bearing God's name. Now, in the passage we covered, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. I'm going to teach you something uh, useful. It can be used in any situation for the Bible. How to word search. You go to your internet browser, your search browser, and you type in the passage you want to search. And you put in the word interlinear. Usually, the first option that comes up is uh, with something like Bible Hub Interlinear. So you click on it. It will take you to this page. Uh, I've been showing you screenshots on this page where you see the original language in here is Hebrew. And these are all actually links. So, for example, you shall take not. So you see the word take there. 5375, if you click on it, it takes you to this concordance. On the left side, you can see uh, all the definitions, what it means to lift, to carry, to take. On the right side, you see, you can scroll down further, many appearances uh, of this word. For example, in Genesis 7, verse 17, the waters lifted up the ark. So you can see that this word, uh, do not take the name of your Lord in vain, can actually mean lift. So it can actually be understood as you should not bear or lift or carry the name of your God in vain. Now, I'm sure, uh, especially after this MCO period, you're all familiar with these guys. These are the food panda delivery people. And you can tell they, are, they work for food panda because of the bright pink they wear, their bright pink box and the food panda logo. So you could say they are 
bearing the name of Food Panda. They are carrying the name, they are lifting the name, they are taking the name of Food Panda. Now imagine that if you some Food Panda delivery people got into a fight or argument with customers and started punching them, and the video camera recorded everything and put on YouTube, everybody in the country, in the world, can see this Food Panda guy boxing a customer. What will happen to Food Panda's business? People will be afraid to order because what if there are other Food Panda riders are this, uh, this dangerous? So you could say that they have, because of their behavior, they have shown food, uh, they have taken Food Panda's name in vain. They have shown disrespect to the, the Food Panda name which they carry on themselves. Or if, I'm sure you recognize this logo on the shoe, it's Nike's Swash, uh, Swish, Swish, I think. So it's Nike's logo. And you can see this uh, bicycle rider has that logo on his arm. If you know who this is, this is Lance Armstrong. And you know the controversy he was involved in, uh, drug use for performance enhancement. So when this, when he was discovered that he's using performance enhancing drugs, Nike cut ties with him. Why? You can't have somebody who's a bad example, a bad, gives a bad name with your logo on it, your name on it. You'll be, give a bad example, you bad testimony to all the customers. So Nike cut ties with Lams Armstrong. He can no longer bear Nike's name. He can no longer lift up Nike's logo. And the same goes for all of us. <clears throat> Some of us would like to wear crosses or shirts with uh, Christian designs. And we go around our daily lives. But it's a walk we are a walking testimony. Everyone knows that you're Christian if you're wearing a cross. How about our behavior? Do we uh, curse? Do we uh, fight with other people, talk bad about people behind their backs? Do we act lazy? All this gives a bad testimony to the cross, the one who died on the cross that we hang around our neck. Or maybe you've seen these kind of car stickers before. In the case of the rapture, in case of the rapture, this car will be unmanned. And you have a Holy Spirit there, and you have a cross there. And imagine you have this kind of car sticker, and then you drive like a maniac. You cut in front of people, you haunt people. Everybody knows who is driving the car. He's a follower of this Jesus. If you bad, behave badly on the road, you're getting such a bad testimony to the name you bear, the name that your car bears. That's why if you have a sticker, you have a cross or that sort in your car, remember what is on your car, what name is on your car, what logo is on your car, and act accordingly. <clears throat> so when we go and baptize people, when we bring them into the body of Christ. Jesus told us to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Take note, in the Greek, this is a singular. There's only one name for the three members of the Trinity. They are one. So they have one name and we have to baptize new believers in this name. They join our body of Christians. So even uh, in Acts, when people start, started calling the believers Christians, because we are ambassadors for Christ. Whatever we do reflects on the one whom we belong to, Jesus Christ. We are his ambassadors. We, Christ makes his appeal through us. And if we are rude, we are combative, we are unpleasant, we are bad people, it reflects badly on the one whose name we bear. We are Christians. We bear the name of Jesus Christ, Christ, on us. So that's bearing his name. We carry his logo with us. And we move on to a similar uh, related, uh, related aspect of this. Now, Paul says when we receive the word and we were saved, we believe in Jesus, we were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. What this means is uh, when we receive Jesus into our hearts, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit, and this is a guarantee, it's a down payment to show us that yes, one day we will be glorified, we will be resurrected, we will spend eternity with our God. Until then, in this earthly life, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. Now, in the ancient times, a seal has a meaning of chalk, a stamp. So, 
This is an example of uh, King Hezekiah's stamp, his seal. What they will do is when they have an official letter from the king or uh, let's say an expensive, expensive vase that he keeps his treasures in, they will take wax, melt it and put it on top of the letter and they will stamp it with King Hezekiah's name. It belongs to him now. Everybody can see his name on it. So you can get that kind of idea when the Holy Spirit seals us. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit. He, we, are, we are put with wax on our heart and the name of God is stamped on our heart. We belong to him. We bear his name. And we see this uh, quite strongly in Revelation. When the end times comes, when there's great trouble, uh, there are believers who trust in God, who are sealed on their foreheads with the seal of the living God. So it's the same idea as being sealed with the Holy Spirit. And uh, 144,000 have his name, God's name, Jesus' name, and his Father's name written on their foreheads. So they are literally bearing God's name on their foreheads. And once uh, in the new heaven and new earth, those of us who believe in Jesus, who are resurrected to be with God, will have his name on our foreheads. And this actually harkens back to the Old Testament in Ezekiel. Uh, God says, God sends somebody to go to a city and put a mark on the foreheads of all of those who are very upset over all the horrible things, all the evil things happening in the city. And eventually, God will send a punishment through the city and kill many people, judge them for their sins. But those who have the mark on their forehead will not be touched. And it's very interesting in Hebrew. Again, you go to the interlinear, the word for mark is tall. And this is actually a Hebrew letter. So the person goes to a city and puts a Hebrew letter on the foreheads of those who still believe and are loyal to God. And this Hebrew tall actually looks like a cross. So you can see how it links back, or rather Revelation links back to this. That those who have the mark, who have the name of Jesus on their foreheads are spared from harm because they are sealed with his name. So it's interesting that even in the Old Testament, you can imagine people sealed with a cross on their forehead to say that these people belong to God. They belong to Christ. And we see the flip side of this, the other end of this, uh, in Revelation, the famous mark of the beast. So it says that whoever receives the mark of the beast on his forehead, see the forehead there, on his hand, and worship it, and worship his image, they will be punished forever and ever. Now, it may seem a bit, a bit uh, harsh just because you receive a mark on your hand or forehead, you go to hell forever. But this is linked back to having God's name being sealed with God's name, bearing his name, and having God's name on our forehead. To receive his name and carry his name means we worship and follow, uh, follow Yahweh. So those who follow and worship the beast get his mark. So it's not as sim so simple as just getting a number tattooed on your hand. It's giving your, whole, the, giving your whole life over to the beast, which means you're worshiping the beast instead of Yahweh. So this your punishment for that, of course, if you no longer follow God, well, he won't want you with him either. He'll let you have your way. So we've covered uh, taking, respecting God's name, and we've covered bearing his name. And we go on to a third level, a deeper level, that God's name is his presence. Now, this is actually an uh, ancient, uh, an ancient concept. We might not really have this concept in our modern times, but when the Bible was written, you had this concept that the name is synonymous with the presence. Now, in Deuteronomy, um, God said to Moses, eventually, when he reaches the promised land, God will choose a place to put his name and his habitation there. He will choose a place that God, uh, Yahweh will put his name to dwell there. Now, if you use our modern English understanding, our westernized understanding, it seems a bit strange, right? To put your name there. Uh, put your name there, what? You just write your name there. If I, I put my name there, I put the word Scott there. 
maybe like some of uh sometimes you have um what you call it buildings they are sponsored by somebody then you put there the name uh datuk sri something something building or something something uh the something something memorial hall so you put their name there but this is not is how it's understood in ancient times his name being there and dwelling there means his presence being there so we continue on with passages about the temple now the ark of god is called by the name of yahweh who sits enthroned above the cherubim take this as the presence yahweh's presence is there enthroned above the cherubim or jerusalem is the city that yahweh had chosen to put his name there to put his presence there and when solomon builds a temple he cites back that he intends to build a house for the name of yahweh his god just as god promised to david his father that the son who in this case is solomon shall build a house for my name so god wants to put his name has in this house he puts his presence in this house and you see this fulfilled when solomon has completed the temple and a cloud fills the house of the lord and the glory of the lord yahweh fills the house so his name came to live in this house his presence lives in this house and we sang i chose this song this morning for a reason the name of the lord is a strong tower the righteous run to it and are safe how do you run to a name how do you run into a name but if a name means the presence when you're with god you're in his protection when you're surrounded by god his presence who can harm you and in exodus when uh, moses was to lead the israelites in, uh, out of egypt and into the promised land yahweh promised to send an angel before and you have to listen to him you have to obey him because my name yahweh's name is in him so this is the angel with yahweh's name in him but when you go to isaiah this a uh, same passage this passage is talking about the same event he says the angel of his presence yahweh's presence so yahweh's name is in the angel yahweh's presence is in the angel his name is his presence in ancient understanding god's name is also his presence and of course as i have shared before this angel is not a created being is sim- the able angel simply means messenger and who is the messenger who has yahweh's presence yahweh's very name in him the new testament says in many places including in jude that this was jesus the messenger from god who had god's name who had god's presence in him was jesus and you see this in a uh, passages about messiah the lord himself in this case is adonai and it's quite interesting uh, side check a bit in many old testament passages when he's talking about god coming in the flesh coming to rule over his people in person his presence with us instead of using yahweh the lord in all caps he uses adonai so it's quite interesting that sometimes this hints towards which member of the trinity is talking about anyway the lord will give you a sign uh you shall call his name emmanuel and as matthew explains emmanuel means god with us and you shall call his name jesus for he will save people from his sins jesus in hebrew being yeshua meaning yahweh saves so jesus has god's name in him yeshua and his name is god with us the presence of god with us so you can see how jesus was once once came during old testament times in the form of the messenger of yahweh who has god's presence who has god's name in him and i spoken on this at length before uh during last christmas so if you want to cover it back i go through it on my youtube channel so you can just take a look at that if you want now continuing on in the new testament it said that we our body is a temple of the holy spirit so again we have the presence of god with us not just his name 
His name is His presence. And when we go baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, when you think of the name of God as His presence, it suddenly gives you a new insight into it. When He baptized in His name, God, Jesus, really is with us. His presence is with us. God is there, present there at the baptism, uh, observing, witnessing that somebody has chosen to bear His name, to be part of His body of believers. He is with us. And this passage that you know that when two or three are gathered in His name, there He is among them. His name and He is among them. So again, God's name, Jesus' name is His presence among us. So what is the takeaway conclusion from, all, from this sharing? I went through three different levels, that being respecting His name. The plain meaning, the easiest meaning of do not take the Lord's name in vain. We don't use his name as a curse. We don't say bad about his name. Treat him with respect as, as we would treat the king or our parents or our boss or your own name. The second level, that we bear his name. Everywhere we go, people know we are Christians from the way we act, from the way we talk, from symbols we might put on our body or our clothes or our car or the music we listen to, or maybe you see a Bible. So whatever we do, it reflects on the name of our God. What we do can shame Him or glorify Him. So we need to bear His name correctly. And third one is the presence of God. We have His name on us. We have His presence with us. He is always with us, which is why we are told to live our lives in a holy manner, to have clean hands and a pure heart, to let no foul language come out of our lips. The Holy Spirit is literally with us right now. Everything we say and do, everything we think, He's observing it. So these three levels, respecting His name, bearing His name, and remembering that His presence, His name, His presence is with us. Through the mouth, through the hands, and through the heart. With your mouth, bless the Lord. Don't use His name as a curse word. With your hands, the things you do that people can see, do good so that people will honour and respect and glorify His name. And in your heart, always keep yourself pure, keep yourself as a pure temple of the Holy Spirit. God's name, God's presence is with us. His presence is in us. So let us be holy and acceptable to Him so we can be a suitable temple for he no longer lives in a temple made by human hands. He no longer lives in the temple of stone in Jerusalem, which has been destroyed. Now, we are his temple. His presence lives within us. His glory is within us. Live our lives in a way that is glorifying to his name. And with that, uh, close in prayer. Lord, we thank you because we have this wonderful privilege that your name is within us. We bear your name. We are part of your kingdom. We are your ambassadors. We are part of your company and we have your corporate logo on us. Everywhere we go, people can see your mark on us, your name on us. And we have to help us to remember to be careful with your name, not to use it lightly, not to use it rudely, not to act in a way that shames your name and not to live our lives or think evil thoughts in a way that grieves the Holy Spirit that lives within us, your Holy Spirit. Help us to be pure and holy. Help us to be worthy of the name that we bear. We thank you for all this, Lord. Even as we go back to our daily lives, we pray that you will be with us, continue to bless us and protect us and help us to return the kindness you've shown us to honour your name always. In the holy name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.